Hello, welcome back to Weekly Wildlife Wisdom. As always, I am your host, Zero Yeti. Let's go ahead and get into it, with our first organism being one of the rarest living organisms on the planet, and certainly one of the rarest large organisms. We have the first animal on the list is the Javan rhinoceros, which is also known as the Sunda rhinoceros, or the Lesser one horn rhinoceros. It is the by far the rarest of the five extant species of rhino. And they were once the most widespread of the avian rhinoceros species, uh, with their range being from Java, the islands of Java and Sumatra, throughout Southeast Asia and Indonesia, and all the way into China and India. However, today their population of less than 100 individuals is limited to living in one peninsula of the Ujan Kilon National Park. Um, have, they managed to recolonize it after the eruption of Krakatoa in 1883 destroyed much of the island. Uh, at over two tons in weight, 10 feet in length, they are the largest animal on the island of Java, where they inhabit lowland rainforests and grassy floodplains, where they uh, eking out a solitary existence by feeding on a diversity of plant species uh, such as shoots, twigs, young foliage, and fallen fruit. Centuries of poaching for their horn and armored skin, while the later latter, which was once used for military uniforms of Chinese and Vietnamese soldiers, has led to only the males having horns, a trend similar to how elephants are evolving without tusks by the ivory trade. They were once very present in Vietnam, however, due to this poaching, uh, the last individuals outside of Java went extinct in the early 2000s. Next up is Bilana Boliopsis. Boliopsis uh, amphibilium is commonly known as the lobe jelly or the common slash northern comb jellyfish. It is a species of comb jelly in the family Bolinopsidae. They possess a thin, oblong, transparent, and gelatinous body that can reach up to six inches in length. They have toothed and tentacles, which they use to catch prey such as fish eggs, rotifers, copepods, and zooplankton by filter feeding. Like other comb jellies, they move by using long longitudinal rows uh, and four short rows of luminescent cilia. This cilia is arranged in transverse plates and beaten sequency, giving the animal its iridescent appearance and allow it to move. They occur in a wide range throughout the northern Atlantic, northern Pacific, and even the Arctic Oceans, as well as the Bering, Mediterranean and, uh, Seas, and the Sea of Cortez, at around depths of about 3,200 feet. Nematodes, or roundworms, constitute the phylum Nematoda, with plant parasitic nematodes being also known as eelworms. Although a little more than digestive tracts with gonads, nematodes are a diverse animal phylum which can which have successfully adapted to nearly every ecosystem on the planet, including freshwater, marine, and terrestrial. Uh, they are often outnumber other animals in both individual and species counts in their habitats, and are found in locations as diverse as mountains, deserts, and ocean trenches. Uh, every part of Earth's lithosphere, even at great depths, such as the 12,000-foot uh, gold mines in South Africa, 12,000 foot deep, they represent roughly 90% of all animals that are found in the ocean floor, and their numerical dominance, often exceeding a million individuals per square meter, means they account for about 80% of all individual animals on Earth. Uh, their diversity of life cycles and their presence in various trophic levels make them invaluable to many ecosystems. Vast arrays of nematodes have parasitic forms, which are found in most plants and animal species, with a third of the genre of nematodes occur as parasites and vertebrates. Uh, there are about 35 nematode species that occur in humans alone. Next up is the hookbill or Dutch hookbill duck, which is a breed of domestic duck characterized by its unusual downturned uh, curved beak. It is an ancient breed with origins unknown and has been documented since the 17th century. The hookbill is a lightly built duck on average weighed around 5 pounds. Uh, and there are three color variants that are recognized, which, the du which are the dusty mallard, uh, the white rib dusty mallard, and then the white, oh, and then the 
pure white. Uh, in times past, there were they were chief egg-laying duck in Europe. With around about a hundred years ago, there being as many hook-billed egg duck eggs being laid and sold per day as there were chicken eggs. However, in recent years, because of the because of the times change, like tastes, cultural tastes have changed as far as uh, culinary etiquette. Duck eggs have kind of fallen out of favor, uh, and today they're the hook-billed duck is considered an endangered breed, with less than 1,000 individuals remaining. Next up is the pied bat, or Numabaha serpaba, uh, also known as the badger bat, is a rare species of vesper bat in the family Vesperolatolidae. With the distinctive pied bat partly resembles a bee with light yellow stripes and blotches on its body, the stripes being primarily on its back. Due to its unique cranial characteristics, ear shape, and wing morphology, it has been argued that the pie bat should be placed in its own genus, uh, Numabaha. Uh, but this is still argued that it should still remain in the Vesper family. Uh, it is found throughout subtropical dry forest uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Ivory Toast, Ghana, and South Sudan, where, like other bats, it spends its night hunting for various insects. Next up is one of my personal favorite animals, which is the desert grassland whiptail lizard. Uh, they are an all species, all not all species, all female species of reptile found throughout North America. They are native to the deserts and lowland grasslands of Arizona and northern Mexico, as well as along the Rio Grande River in New Mexico. Uh, they can be found in loose congregations of individuals hunting insects, chiefly ants, beetles, and termites. And sunning themselves. Uh, these reptiles produce via asexual reproduction, which is called parthenogenesis. And in this process, eggs undergo a chromosomal doubling after meiosis and then develop into lizards without being fertilized. However, ovulation is triggered by female and female courtship and mating, which has also proven to increase fertilization success. So these lizards gay. And I find that amazing. Uh, it should also be noted that it has been recently discovered that the desert whiptail lizard has chromosome triplets, where each triplet is paired with its copy rather than its counterparts. And this reproductive method enables the sexual, the asexual desert grassland whiptail lizard to have genetic diversity previously thought to, only, to have been unique to sexually reproductive species. And the extinct organism of the week is one of my favorites and probably one of yours as well, is the woolly mammoth, also known as the northern mammoth or the Siberian mammoth. They were 10 foot tall, 6 ton, shaggy furred elephant species that dwelled throughout Europe, Asia, and North America during the last ice age. They traveled in large herds of dozens of individuals and dominated the mammoth steppe grassland habitat, which is what, which is, they're named after them. Uh, they fed along a variety of shrubs and grasses, knocking down trees and maintaining the ecosystem. Mammoths uh, figured significantly into the art and lives of primitive humans, with there being a litany of Paleo and Neolithic tools and dwellings made from mammoth bones, hides, and other parts of the animals, as well as multiple cave paintings and carvings depicting entire herds of mammoths. Despite being hunted to extinction on the mainland around 8000 BC, isolated populations throughout Arctic islands, notably Wrangell Island, uh, managed to survive until some three to four thousand years ago, long enough to see the pyramids of e Giza in Egypt being built. The relative abundance and at times excellent preservation of the species carcasses found uh, throughout permafrost in the northern latitude survived much information about the mammoth's biology and habits. We know what they ate. Uh, what color their fur was, usually dark brown, sometimes black, and sometimes like reddish. Um, we even know like wear patterns on their tusk and how they like use their tusk and how they fed and uh, what their blood types were. We've even found like liquid blood in their veins. It's truly fascinating. Uh, some specimens have been so well preserved, we've even managed to extract viable DNA and sequence the species genome. 
Currently, there are even research labs throughout Sweden, the United States, Japan, and Russia attempting to resurrect the species through cloning, using Asian elephants, which are the woolly mammoth's closest living relatives, as surrogate parents. Uh, the thought of doing this in particular is also part of the overall uh, attempt to try and bring back the mammoth steppe ecosystem, which a lot of people tend to think northern latitudes just aren't that rich in species diversity, but what we're finding is when we dig up more and more bones from the last ice age, is they had just as high species diversity and different trophic levels and different niches as like the African Serengeti. It was just in like a colder area. And we think by recreating this ecosystem, by bringing back mammoths and rhinos and like cave lions and cave bears, as well as reintroducing stuff like horses and bison and antelopes, um, we can recreate the mammoth ecosystem, steppe ecosystem, which turns all this unproductive uh, barren taiga, well, taiga has the trees, barren tundra and like these big dense taiga patches of just these slow growth trees that didn't used to exist and kind of re-fertilize and re-establish this ecosystem. And this will help in species diversity. This will help in uh, slowing down climate change because like all the grasses and stuff will be absorbing CO2, as well as the grasses will reflect sunlight, as well as the herbivores will uh, be constantly digging up the snow during winter to get to the grasses uh, and lower the insulation because instead of several feet of snow, you only have a couple inches after like mammoths and stuff walk through it uh, searching for food. And so that will decrease uh, the insulation potential and therefore slow down the melting of permafrost because one of the big factors of climate change that we're experiencing right now is all the ice sheets keep melting and like all the permafrost keeps melting and when the permafrost melts, all that carbon and all that methane that's been stored in the permafrost gets released, uh, which acts to greenhouse gas, which makes things hotter, which then in turn causes more permafrost to melt, which then in turn causes more greenhouse gases to be melted. And we think by reintroducing the mammoth step ecosystem, we can slow this down dramatically. As always, uh, in fact, uh, I believe one park is actually currently doing this. It's called like. Uh, Pleistocene Park. It's over in Russia. It's run by a guy named Sergei Zimov. Um, and he's done some pretty fascinating work. It's Look it up if you have the chance. As always, take care to my guys, gals, non-binary pals. Goodbye.